Welcome to the wonderful world of wine. We are your hosts, Mark Lindsay and Kim Simone, exploring all things wine with you. You can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today on The Wonderful World of Wine. How are you, Kim? I'm well. How are you, Mark? Everything's great. Every week we are here to talk with the listeners of all things wine. And today I have an article from Wine Enthusiast, Kim, that we're going to talk about. Uh, What does STEMI mean in wine? And it's probably something people have not heard commonly used in the Mm -hmm. wine world. And typically the practice has to do with how the wine is fermented. Would you like to... uh, Start out, Kim, with this STEMI topic? Sure. So, you know, we use a lot of interesting terms <laughs> to describe the flavors and the textures and the things that we're experiencing when we taste our favorite or maybe not so favorite wines. Um, and sometimes those flavors might sound sort of strange and off-putting, even if we mean them in a positive way. And I think that STEMI is one of those terms that could can go either way. It can either be a positive or it can be a negative, depending on what the taster likes, uh, depending on what the purpose, I would say, depending on what the winemaker was intending uh, when they made the wine. So when we use the word STEMI, uh, we generally are trying to refer to this sort of green, unripe flavor. Sometimes it can take on sort of a, a bitter or a or a harsh kind of a note, but then other times it can be seen as sort of refreshingly green. So um, a lot of the times when we come across these flavors in wine, they often have to do with how the winemaker decides to make the wine and whether they literally want to use some of the stems from the plant and that that bunch of grapes is actually hanging on in the fermentation process. And there can be a number of reasons why a winemaker might want to leave some of the stems in there. uh, And that goes to the production of certain styles of wine, very particular methods of fermentation. But I I really wanted to right off the bat kind of talk about, well, what are we talking about? Well, you know, what is the actual flavor concept that we're talking about when we say the word STEMI? Yeah, I like how you started out relating it to flavor because the the wine enthusiast article was more on the the whole technique that's used to create this flavor in the wine. And when I hear someone say, oh, you, you, well, I, I never honestly hear anyone say this, this wine is STEMI. But when I hear the word STEMI, I'm thinking, like you say, a profile that somehow some sort of green or vegetal or something going on more than the method mm-hmm. of how it's made to to include the stem. So I'm glad you started with that. So the listeners are probably thinking, well, you know, Kim and Mark talking something geeky again in wine. Uh, But it's it's good that people know the practice of using the whole cluster of the grape, throwing that in and fermenting it. And it gives different things to the wine. I mean, including the stems, you you would give more more, uh, acid, more bitterness, more tannins to the final product. So why don't you talk a little bit about whole cluster fermentation, because that is something that you do see on a bottle. You know, you may not see this descriptive term STEMI in anything uh, on the back of a bottle or in a tasting note, but you certainly do see the phrase whole cluster fermentation or partial cluster fermentation. So why don't you talk about that a little bit? Wow, we're right on the the same page. (laughs) Were you going to ask, were you going to love that question at me? No, no, I, I... That's where I wanted to go next because you're very <laughs> rarely going to see that being described, the wine being described as STEMI. So how can we tell that they're using this whole cluster fermentation? They will tell you that in the text sheet, and you can assume we know from that that they're using the whole grape and the stems and everything. So mm-hmm. the whole clusters, they're basically throwing everything in. Typically, a winery destems all the grapes off of the vine and off the grape stem. What's the word? Look, stems, right? Bunch. I mean, a bunch. bunch of grapes. Yeah, they take everything off, and that's pretty 
standard practice, but a lot of people also just throw the whole cluster in and let it just ferment. And uh, it's very popular with Pinot Noir or Gamay or Syrah. And it adds a lot of qualities for things that lack, like thin skin grapes. This is a very common practice, and that's which most of those grapes are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you're going to want to go deeper into the whole cluster. So <laughs> what would you like? I just wanted to say that for some winemaking processes, sometimes it's a little hard to know what a winemaker has done because they don't necessarily put it on a label. But this is a technique that when a winemaker does use it, they usually want to make a point of it because it does change the flavor a bit. And I know from experience that when you know that this is a production method that's been used in a particular wine, it leads to all sorts of other things that you can say, compare that wine to, or have a pretty cool wine tasting where you can compare different different styles of wine because their methods of production were different. So I think that it's really helpful when either tech sheets or the bottle of wine itself or the winemaker says, yeah, this is how we make this wine. And I think it's really, it's a style that really can appeal to people who prefer a lighter, fresher, fruitier style of red. And like you mentioned before, you often see some Pinot Noirs that are made this way and they'll put it right on the front of the label. So I think it might be a little unusual to people who have maybe not heard this term before, but it certainly is a winemaking method that producers are are proud of when they use it. Would you say that it definitely adds tannin or spice or some sort of herbal or vegetal I think it depends on how ripe the grapes are and how ripe the the stems are. I certainly have had some Beaujolais that are made with this method that often when you think of Beaujolais made with whole cluster or carbonic maceration, you tend to think of the ones that are lighter and fruitier and sort of fruit punchy. But I've had some that are pretty serious and they have like you mentioned, sort of the, those spice notes and some really interesting things going on. So I don't think you can always say, oh, it's just going to be a, you know, a light fruity wine. Because sometimes I do get those, you know, I don't want to call them green because sometimes they don't come across as green notes, but yeah, spicy. Let's go with spicy. Yeah, I agree with that. Now, I wanted to ask you, Kim, we talk a lot on this show about natural wines. Have you ever seen natural wines marketed that they use whole cluster? Um, Cause I, I'm I, not that I can recall, but I, I can't say that I've been looking either. The whole process and idea behind the natural wines, they take what's given to them and let the wine do its natural thing right when they're making it. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious if the mentality also is that let's just throw everything in there. Let's not, you know, yeah, I don't, I don't cluster. know. That but would I, make a certain amount of sense but I can't say that I have really dug that deep into it. It's not wine trend that I'm particularly big on. So I haven't really spent the time to uh, look into it, I guess. Yeah. I just never seen it presented to me. Mm-hmm. Like not only is it natural, but we're using everything, you know what I mean? Cause they'd yeah. be, no, I, yeah, I know what you it, mean. it would almost be like a waste thing for, yeah. for someone who's going that deep with the wine making. Mm-hmm. So I, I was just curious if that was something out there or not. So I did a little research. We talked Pinot Noir as being one of the big whole cluster fermented grapes in the world. And the famous DRC, Burgundy, right? They 60%. DRC is, oh. Yeah, 60% of their wines are whole cluster fermentation wines. And I was shocked. (laughs) What's the proper pronunciation? Domain Roman? Romane Conte. Romane Conte. Okay. So the the short is DRC, is DRC. Like the, the big thing in the wine world. But uh, yeah, they, they do a 60% of their wines they make. It would make cluster. sense for Burgundy, especially for, you know, really good Burgundy, because you're trying to get as much flavor, as much oomph out of those grapes as possible. So I get that. Yeah. So if the listeners want to explore stemmy wines... And what it means, just look for that whole cluster fermentation method on a wine when it's made. And it's out there. On the, it'll be on the tech sheet, the geeky thing we always talk about. You're listening to The Wonderful World of Wine, and we are your hosts, Mark and Kim. You can find more information about Mark at franklinlickers.com. 
And you can find more information about myself at commonwealthwineschool.com. And as always, you can find us on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Welcome back to The Wonderful World of Wine. We found an, an article about a topic that we often will touch upon when we are having the conversation with people about what is a good wine? How can I know that what I'm buying is a good choice? And what do the scores mean? <laughs> so this is a, a little uh, somewhat snarky article <laughs> about wine scores and why wine scores on a bottle of wine really might not mean a whole lot of anything. And, and this has sort of been the trend in the uh, in the wine score conversation over the last uh, few years, I would say, it used to be that if a wine got a you know ninety nine points or goodness a one hundred point, that the like the presses would stop and all of that wine would immediately be allocated and the price would go up and nobody would be able to find it and it would just be this like mad rush to get that wine. I don't think that it necessarily feels that way anymore. How do you feel from a yeah, uh, I, retail perspective? I see that about too. That? Yeah. Years ago, I think more consumers were looking for things based on points. They wanted to find the higher rated things. And of course, sales, people would always sell based on that. But now I think it's less people really care about and seek the points, but more people still try to sell you a wine based mm -hmm. on the points. Does that make sense? I'm surprised so, that people still even bring up it, points, frankly. People trying to sell me a wine or you and you'll notice it more and more they're putting points on the labels little mm -hmm. stickers and stuff mm -hmm. um, and I, I had kind of a culture thing with this i just recently watched a movie called tokyo wine party and it was the whole wine scene in tokyo hmm. and how the parties are based on them only serving like 100 point 99 point wines most of which were counterfeit anyway but they, uh, <laughs> The big thing is points. So you were saying this is, article is a little offbeat, but it did raise a good point that what is this 100-point system? And is it really in a 100-point system? Like we're all used to you know, getting grades in school based on the 100 points. If you get a mm -hmm. 50, it's a 50. But in the wine world, the scale is really not a 100-point range because you're not seeing 10-point rated wines or 20 points. You, you rarely see anything lower than mid 80s well there, frankly neither is your score for grades right like well, if you're getting anything lower grade. than a 60 whatever you're yeah, failing i mean how many there. people get a 10 on a poor card <laughs> right. i would hope very very rarely well, my college calculus days i got some some you know, <laughs> <double digits>. oh, <laughs> calculus. <laughs> but, yeah but i yeah you're exactly right so i think that was one of his points was that the range is really probably a 15 point scale. And, and if I would, I would say I would push back and say like a 25 because I've certainly seen some scores in the seventies. Seventies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, you don't, it's rare. It's that very rare. It's very rare. And that because was I mean, even really mass produced inexpensive wine these days, most of it is fairly well-made consistently made. It doesn't smell off. It doesn't taste off. There's nothing microbially weird going on in there. Most wine out there in the market that people are buying, yes, it might not be super duper complex, but most everything is fairly well made. That was another point that Gus Clemens raised in this article is that most consumers, can you really taste the difference between if someone tells you it's 88 points or it's 90 points. What's what's the taste difference in that range? So like you said, there's a lot of stuff out there that's just easy drinking wine that you could easily, anyone could rate it 90 points, right? I mean, it could compare to other things. It's tasting good. It's 90 points. So he raised a couple of good points about critics and how we really judge that. Now, Robert Parker was the gentleman who came up with the 100-point system, right? Mm-hmm. And it was but, fairly brilliant to use a system that Americans kind of inherently were familiar with because of, like you said before, school grading, which is different from the English system. So it really was, I think, a really smart way of appealing to this idea that it wasn't something that he had to teach Americans. Like you say, oh, this is a 95. You know what a 95 is if you went to school, grade school in America. 
Right. Whereas, like you mentioned, the UK only uses a 20 point right. scale. So he, maybe he didn't like that. So he figured the Americans won't relate to that as well. And he came out with this system. I have to ask you, Kim, you obviously have the, well, I don't want to say you have the opportunity, but you shop. I'm a shopper. So, I mean, I notice mm-hmm. things on the, sh- on the store shelf. Do you even look at the points? Um, I will look at them. I don't know that it sways me one way or the other, but I think it's interesting to see what bottles have them, what stores still use them. So, you know, I think it's a point of interest, but for me, not necessarily something that is going to make a decision for me. But I do still feel like there is some value to a consumer who maybe doesn't necessarily know what a particular brand is all about or what this particular wine is like. And to see, you know, something in the 90s, I I think that it's a, a fair bit of comfort for a lot of consumers to say, oh, okay, this is this at least somebody else says that this is a good wine. So <laughs> I'm not the only one making the decision here. It seems lately I see them use more for tricks. In, in other words, they'll put that sticker on the bottle, you know, 91 points. And then you look around and it'll say the 2002 vintage yeah. or it's but that you trick's know, been going on for a really long time. <laughs> yeah, but I think more and more, and that's where people have to be careful because just because at one point in its career, a winery got that rating doesn't mean that wine in that bottle, that drinking or buying got that rating. There could be something said about if they're saying, you know, for the last 10 years, we've gotten 90 plus points every year. What I like to do, and we, we talk about this a lot too, is that you can find in, uh, anything good or bad about any wine you want if you dig deep enough into a Google search. And I always just try to use like a, publications that are kind of similar to my palette. And then I'll relate yeah. that to another publication. So if, if two or three publications reviewed a wine and they're all within a couple of points, then you know everyone's pretty consistently saying that that's a good wine or because it's 90 or 92 mm-hmm. points or whatever. But if you see one like really high and then one like really low and totally different profile descriptions, then that's got to set you off like why, right? So those are the kind of ones I I would stay away from or then I'd have to make my own view on it to taste it. I don't know how you, when you see something, if you go with one critic and you, you kind of stick with that and so you trust their points. I trust importers more than I trust critics. I think because I pay attention to who is bringing the wine in more than I pay attention to what certain people are saying about the wines. Because if it's a wine that I've tasted and I've tasted it and I think it's good, then the only one that I need to worry about is me. (laughs) Does that sound like totally snobby? But I guess, you know, if it's a wine that I've never had before, I don't know. That's not really a whole lot of critics that I pay attention to. And I think that that just goes to show that maybe they are a little less influential these days. And that's a, that's another thing when you say, you know, do we trust these people? Because a lot of times people have to, a winery has to submit wines to be reviewed for the major publications. And I, I'm pretty sure they, right. To say, they'll say, send me, send me free wine. We'll review it. But Hey, you might want to advertise with us too. And you know, so <laughs> there's a lot of people that feel, and I think that was one of the points in this article was, can you trust them? That's how I've always you, felt. You know, it's like, it, Oh, certain publications, the nice big two-page spread. And oh, look at the nice high scores they give these wines. Right. And a lot of the times there'll be a review on one page and you flip it over and there's a full page ad on the next page. So you're like, wait, I just saw this. Some- oh, yeah, they just reviewed it over <laughs> here and then they're advertising here. So that's been going on for years as well. So you have to decide who you want to trust. And, you, you know, you and I, we both look at all the publications and I noticed more and more the same brands being reviewed all the time. And I think that the winemakers I've talked to in the past, they don't even want to submit the wines to some of those publications because it's, they feel they shouldn't have to pay all the money and take Mm -hmm. the chance that they're not going to give them the time to even review it and put it in. So now are these more smaller family owned, privately owned wineries that you're talking right, about or right, more, yeah, you know, yeah. reps from the bigger brands? I've heard a lot of negative feedback from people who want to submit things for scores mm-hmm. that it's not worth it. 
And we talked in the past about the I use a rating system for my shelf talkers, and the gentleman uses a zero to a hundred point scale on his review system. And he always kind of got upset with me when I always had at fifty and go up. When his mentality was on this system, you could you could rate zero, ten. So people who didn't understand the wine scores、mm-hmm. were given wines tens and twenties. They would only give like two points for sight, two points for smell. They didn't know、mm-hmm. like how the the real hundred point scale worked, but they thought that was okay because that's、right. was、yeah. their rating. It was zero to a hundred. Because you're right、but、about the consistent my- the consistency issue. You know, if you're not all following the same rules, then one wine is not going to stack up to another wine if you're using different systems. Absolutely, Ex- exactly. And that was it. People who understood the hundred point scale in the wine world were starting and knew to go higher,、mm-hmm. and the people who just learning about reviewing were just putting in what they thought was a number. So right, but also because. The system that you use, you assign points for each of the different components of the wine. So, you know, when you take it that way, a little bit off everywhere can result in, you know, not a particularly good score for a wine. Whereas, if you look at it like, okay, if say each category gets what five points, ten points, each is different. I mean, it goes could be fifteen, could be thirty. Okay. So let's say you know, let's say it's ten, right? And if every category you give it just a not nine points for that, you know, you're ending up with a ninety wine, which is pretty good. But if you're eight and you're nine, you're just a little bit off for that. Then you're at an eighty point wine, and right, you know, there's a big difference between an eighty point wine and a ninety point wine. And we know this because we've lived with this hundred point. Scale for a really long time, and we, we, you know, we know that anything, you know, anything over an eighty is good, but it's really like, oh, the better wines, you know, you're sort of starting at eighty-eight and going up from there. Yeah, and to me, it's it's my description that matters.、Mm-hmm. Like、what I what I'm saying that I see and I smell and I taste and my final conclusion on the wine, and at the end, I get some points, and I really don't look at those. But a lot of times, it co- might come out eighty-eight, and I'm like. Yeah, what a, it doesn't to me. It doesn't matter because this is how I can tell the customer what the wine tastes like or what it smells like, and I don't really need the points. But if a consumer it, it, doesn't know how to translate those aromas and flavors and tasting notes that you've got in there, then that number is more valuable for them because it's a quick、yeah. like thing that they can get. Yeah. So yeah, it, that's exactly kind of where I was going. It, to me. The points are there if you want them; they're there. But it's my opinion. So I might tell you I taste and smell cherries. You buy it and you don't. Then you would say, "Wow, that wasn't couldn't have been eighty eight points, right?" Because I didn't <laughs> smell or taste that. It's the profile that to me is important. If you want to just go by the number, and you're looking for a certain number, you're not going to press anyone with Max eighty eight point wine versus wine enthusiasts eighty eight point wine. It's all personal preference, and but the, the、uh, interesting point about and, that comment is that you know I feel like when it comes to the the scoring of wines by big publications, I don't feel that it's the flavors necessarily that are contributing to the score. Like I don't think、right. that yeah, but the, a, but the a raspberry gets a higher score than a blueberry. Right, right, but they do have. The description there with the po- with the、right. points. So, yeah, but I see what you're saying. To one of the the questions I want to ask you: Could you walk into a retailer and say to them, "What do you have for ninety point wines?" Or, <laughs> and they could tell you.、What? Um, I don't know. I mean, some some retailers, or at least that used to, have sections, and、at、there are a couple、rate. that I can think of now that I think still do, like have an entire like sections of their store. That are dedicated to wines that have received higher scores,、Did、and whether that, that is because it makes it easy on the staff or well, whatnot. Because people, I don't know. yeah, the people are probably shopping that way, like、mm-hmm. you said earlier. So, did you have that type of thing at Martinetti? No,、Spoke? they didn't. No. no, we didn't. We didn't put up shelf talkers. We didn't、yeah. put up scores. We relied on on us. <laughs> yeah, and that's a good thing. I mean, over the like I said, over the years, when like the top one hundred. 
wines would come out every year, They'd make a section. These are the top 100 wines. It, it, it was, they had the points, plus they had their rating of the top 100, but those would be a section. Right. Anytime there was a hundred point wine, everyone wanted it and people would make a section on that. But I just don't see the trend as strong as it was. Yeah. I think consumers are a little smarter selecting wine. And for sure, you're not seeing any reviews on the big, most of the big brands. They might have gold medals or something like that, but they're not touting that they're you know, 90 point wines mm -hmm. as much. And I think it's, it's also easier common. for people to find but, information than it used to be. So there's really no need, not no need, but there's yeah, less of a it, need, I feel, it. for people to be relying on what it says on the shelf when you can easily pull out your phone and uh, check something out. Right. And then you got other apps that do stars, you know, three mm -hmm. stars, five stars. What's the, the same That's thing? That's what I do. Like I do stars. Yeah. So what's the difference between a three and a four and that type of thing? It's your own rating that you need to kind of go by when right. you start tracking things. So what did you think was uh, funny about the article that you thought he, you think he was saying? I, I the thought that he joker? was the way that he that retailers or though, if you ask a retailer what the best vintage of any of a particular wine is, they're going to tell you it's the one that they have in stock. Like, Yes, some retailers yeah. do that. But I that just feel like points, that is though. what? Well, that had nothing to do with points. His quote he meant. He, 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 you walk into a store that you're asking about the vintage. You, you, they weren't asking. Yeah, it was about just points, the way that he so. was talking about retailers. I just I felt yeah. that it was unnecessarily disparaging against retailers. Yeah, sticking up for saying, you there, man. He, yeah, no, I appreciate. He wasn't saying. I don't think he was saying people are using it in a wrong way. He could have easily said that, but. I, he started out saying, how can you tell the difference? So I, I was thinking he didn't really care that it's used to sell. But I like how we see the, the different sides of things. <laughs> you have to put that out there because there probably is still people looking for that, what the points are. And, and if honestly, if I see something in a publication that gets a great review and I have it on my shelf, I put that. I'll put it out there and say, hey, I just found this in Decanter or I just found this in Wine Enthusiast or Wine Spectator. Typically, I don't put the you know, Joe's Wine Review. It's people you don't know or people probably wouldn't follow. So mm -hmm. well, I'm glad we got to talk about the 100-point scale, <laughs> 100 wine points. score. Thank you for listening to us today on The Wonderful World of Wine. We have been your hosts, Kim Simone and Mark Lindsay. You can find our past episodes on SoundCloud and iTunes and every week on Franklin Radio 102.9 WFPR and as always on Facebook at The Wonderful World of Wine. Cheers. Bye, bye, bye.